Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and BitamountLive.com and P.O. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And uh, as I mentioned last week, we were going to do some videos to cover the auction results from Asia Week that uh, concluded the last couple of days. And initially, I thought I would do Christie's, Sotheby's, and Bonham, sort of do them all together. When I began going through the results, there was so much interesting stuff that happened. We decided this time around, we're going to do an individual video for each of the major auction houses. Uh, one for Bonham's, one for Christie's, and uh, one for here for Sotheby's. All right, and we're going to start with Sotheby's, and we'll get to Christie's and Bonham's, and we're going to talk a bit more about the... Uh, uh, Doyle sale, which uh, everybody was talking about after that base took off and went for, I think the total price was $2.45 million. Uh, it was quite a story. But uh, uh, we're going to start here uh, with Asia Week at Sotheby's. They had some really interesting results and, and, and some head scratchers. And uh, it, was, it, it, it just shows that uh, Sotheby's estimates don't mean much. Um, uh, we, there's a lot of discussion about estimates and reserves these days, and the bottom line is it doesn't matter what the auction houses say anymore. Um, the, the bidders, uh, uh, many of them extremely savvy, um, uh, are, are going to bid what they think something is worth, and, and we saw numerous cases where uh, the estimates given were just absolutely blown to bits. And uh, we're going to go through some of them. And, and nowhere were these estimates more blown to bits than the 100 Antiques uh, uh, section of the sale. This was the online sale. I don't know how many of you followed it, but it was breathtaking. Uh, uh, a lot of the lots that were in there clearly should have been in, in the important Chinese works of art sale. And we're going to go through it and try to figure out what was happening. All right, and uh, let's uh, mosey on over to the first lot we're going to talk about is this one. Uh, 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 a yellow ground Famille Rose floral bowl dated 20th century with a six to $800 estimate. All right, beautifully done bowl. Uh, I thought it was quite lovely. I looked at it. Uh, I actually had a couple of inquiries. One, buddy, somebody, one person inquired and said, do you think I'll be able to buy it for six or $800? And I said, you might be able to buy it for 50000 but not six to 800 And uh, it ended up uh, going even further. It ended up selling for $176,000 uh, because the crowd agreed that it was probably of the mark and period, I suspect. All right, the, uh, they examined it very carefully, and they went over it. And the only provenance on the bowl was that it was acquired prior to 2000. All of, there were a whole slew of lots that were quote, just acquired prior to 2000. There were some lots in there from the Rothschild family. I don't know if these were consigned by them. Uh, but uh, this, this particular bowl uh, just, you know, as you can see, decimated the uh, reserve. And if you look at it carefully, you'll notice that the foot rim uh, is beautifully done. The enameling is absolutely great on it and I'm sure uh, the people at, at, at Sotheby's are wondering did they did they make a mistake on this what was going on who cataloged it um, and this is the kind of thing that happened this is not a knock on Sotheby's this is a this is just the, the, the way things are today uh, that you, you can't know everything about everything and I think there's so much anxiety about miscataloging something as being old when it's not because the reproductions have gotten absolutely superb uh, I think uh, is, is throwing off uh, the estimating game quite a bit. All right. Um, all I can say is that a lot of stuff today that's being uh, paraded around as Republic is modern, but the Republic period, was, which is 20th century, which is how they're dating this, uh, uh, they, they, they didn't make as much porcelain as people seem to think of high quality during the Republic period. And it's, I think it's sort of become a catch-all for we're not really sure. Okay, and the same thing happened here with this pair of gilt decorated bowls. They were estimated at two to three thousand dollars and ended up selling for a hundred thousand eight hundred. All right, and here they are, uh, beautifully enameled, wonderfully done, nicely potted, uh, well, well formed. You notice the rims are slightly uneven across the tops when you look at them from the side, and uh, th they were. Uh, here are the marks on the bottom, Yongshen marks. All right, and, and a number, all of these bowls that we're going to look at that blew the estimates away were either Chinlung or Yongshan. And uh, this, the, the bottoms of these bowls look good to me. Uh, I didn't examine them in person, but uh, uh, it would have been a very tough call. 
And uh, but the folks that came in that looked at them, they today with technology can look at things over at the, at the in the palace collections, and really find the comps that the, that wasn't possible 20, 30 years ago. Um, I disagreed with uh, Sotheby's on it. A number of people obviously did. That's how you get up there that high, and they ended up selling for uh, you know over 30 times their high estimate. And then going over here, it happened again with a Daosai decorated lotus bowl, just simply dated 20th century. There was hardly any description other than it had a Yongshen mark on it and was acquired prior to 2000. Ended up selling for $69,300. And if you blow this bowl up, the decoration is superb. The decoration is absolutely beautiful. The light blue uh, looks very, very good. Uh, but again, it's a situation where the, the Sotheby's uh, people, um, uh, clearly they don't want to be wrong on this kind of stuff because they want to get it into the right sale and they want to do the right job for their consigners. Uh, they, they, they either missed it or, the, or who knows. And they may still think that this was a 20th century bowl and they just can't explain it. Uh, I haven't heard anything from anybody, but if somebody at Sotheby's wants to uh, explain what the heck happened, I'd love to get the phone call. Uh, because it's an interesting part of the business, and it's not a criticism of them. It's just that uh, uh, the quality of this bowl is obvious, um, and um, how you could arrive at a Republic period uh, or 20th century date uh, against uh, uh, the possibility of it being authentic, uh, but the only problem being is the lack of long-term provenance. And if you're relying so heavily on long-term provenance, and often there isn't any, um, that's it. Uh, I, I, you know, many of these pieces could have been acquired by somebody in the in the in the 1990s or 1980s uh, from a collection from a family through some odd uh, uh, circumstance that, that, that they were presented to them and they bought them. Uh, they could have been from a very old collection. They just didn't write it down. I, I know from personal experience that back in the 1980s and 1970s and 80s and early 90s, items from incredible collections turned up at auctions, and they were never mentioned, uh, the provenance was never mentioned by the auctioneer. And this is in, 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 in local auctions, the auctions here in the Boston area uh, would get things from absolutely amazing estates, old Boston family estates with great Chinese things in them. And the family wanted to remain anonymous. They didn't want dealers calling them up, bothering them, so they asked the auctioneer not to put in any information about the source of the item. That, and unfortunately, that kills the trail as far as researching provenance. That is particularly the case here in New England. I know from personal experience because I ran auctions. And we'd have people um, that were selling unbelievably great things that had long family histories going back to the, you know, in cases where they were the original uh, acquirers of, of a piece of American furniture or art or something back in the 1700s, early 1800s. And they didn't want their name in the listing. They wanted to remain totally anonymous. And sometimes, uh, I'm sure the same thing can happen with Chinese works of art. They end up going through an auction at some point, getting acquired, and then sold later. Here we are 20 years later selling it, and there's no history on the piece. And that may be the case with these bowls because uh, there seems to be a consistent pattern. All it says is acquired before 2000 with no family history. And then you get to this. Now, these are the, some of the really big blowouts. Uh, this was a ruby back uh, uh, dish with a Yongchen mark on it. Um, uh, it has a simple, uh, plain, undecorated front, but the back of it is beautifully enameled. Um, uh, a fair bit of orange peel here, but nicely done. Good looking, narrow, very, very, very thin foot rim. And um, I've had these in the past and uh, got very, very good money for them with these narrow foot rims. And we, I remember one that I had, there was a big debate uh, uh, between a dealer and some people that, uh, whether or not it was old. And I had gotten it from a, from a, a friend of mine who was a, a collector dealer and uh, uh, paid him quite a lot of money for it and ended up selling it for, for a decent price. But uh, th these are the kinds of things that throw people off. And uh, this ended up selling for almost a quarter million dollars with an eight to $1,200 estimate, $226,800. Again, no provenance. And all of these pieces have a similar flavor to them, similar marks, and all of them um, uh, appear to have been misdated. All right, and then this, the ruby uh, enameled uh, stem cup. Again, 20th century, all right, but with a Yongshen mark on the bottom. All right, and uh, they call it an apocryphal Yongshen mark. And it was estimated at one, uh, $1,800 and ended up selling for $378,000. 
Okay, that is a stunning uh, price. And um, now, granted, somebody, you know, you can have a case where you say, well, they got very excited and bought, uh, you know, they, they overpaid for a piece of Republic porcelain. Okay, fine. Eight, estimated eight to 1200 they paid 10000 but when you when you're getting up to th three or four hundred thousand dollars for for a two and a half three inch tall stem cup, um, and lots of competition for it, and a lot of excitement, a lot of talk about it, uh, it you you've got to assume that the ca that the uh, catalogers um, on it uh, were, were off, uh, and again because of fear of being wrong. Fear of being wrong. Okay, and that's really what it comes down to. Uh, the auction houses justifiably have become hyper vigilant about dating uh, um, porcelains that don't have a, a, a long track record. That's why they're always so relieved to, you know, to get a receipt that it was bought in the 1950s, but it came from a well-known collection. It was dispersed from an old collection at some point and ended up in their hands, and they can prove why and how it got there. Short of that, uh, what they're more or less admitting to is that we can't really tell anymore. I hate to say it, but that's what this seems to be. There are areas today in the porcelain world where some awfully sharp people really can't tell anymore, and this is just one of those cases. Uh, this is was this cup was one not two or three inches, one and a quarter inches tall, three hundred and seventy-eight thousand dollars. So I have to believe a number of people were totally convinced that this is a period cup, and they are probably right. All right, and then on to this, a Daosai bamboo decorated 20th century bowl. Uh, again, decorated uh, with, a, with an apocryphal, they say, Yongshen mark. Two to three thousand dollar estimate, it sold for half a million. Again, um, this, is, this, this is a real highlight of uh, uh, how, how far off they can be. And uh, if you de look carefully at the decoration on this, the shape, the outlining, the shading of the greens, how the blues are applied, the tone of the blues, that soft, you know, uh, soft, soft, soft blue, uh, the, 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 the color of the, of the white glaze, the shape um, of the bowl itself, and uh, the bottom, here's the base of it, uh, very consistent with Yongshen work. Beautifully decorated, beautifully uh, uh, marked uh, with a nice looking foot, all right, and uh, it was off to the races and it took off. And of course, it also begs the question is how often are they getting things brought into them that are of this type that they are now misidentifying as being modern when they're not and they're ended up, you know, sending consigners on their way. Um, uh, there, there, there has to be a better system. I think this is, this is a clear sign that there needs to be a better system for dating porcelain than what they're currently using. And they need to maybe move away from a little bit of the paranoia uh, over um, um, unprovenanced or, or pieces without long provenances because this this kind of thing is going to continue to happen and it's going to get worse all right and then the, the the one of the other big guns in the sale was this this ruby back another ruby back porcelain plate with European subject matter um, uh, uh, here's the back of it again young Shen marked uh, uh, very nicely done good looking foot room uh, beautiful red glaze on the back uh, uh, you know, here's the face of the plate. All right, nice, nice, nice decoration. If it looks somewhat familiar to you, the European subject matter, well, here's the Doyle, Doyle uh, uh, vase that brought, uh, uh, the cut down vase that brought $2.4 million. All right, and there are some very striking similarities in the way that this thing is colored, the coloration, uh, this, this sort of violet tone here is uh, up here on this part of the jar, the same type of tone. And tones change over time with enamels. Uh, the, the bluish tone here, the facial expressions, the way the eyes are shaded in. There's a lot of details on here that uh, point towards, uh, 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 you know, uh, Tanging Workshop uh, porcelain. All right, and I don't know how you how you can prove it or, or disprove it unless you, somebody has a, a a very precise comparable example. There may be one in the Palace Museum tucked away or the National Palace Museum tucked away or somewhere, but obviously a lot of people took a good look at this and uh, studied the heck out of it and had plenty of time. And this was an online sale. This wasn't you know an in person auction. And they hit it hard, and they were willing to chase it. And I would like to also say that porcelains seem to be pretty strong. Uh, interesting porcelains were quite strong throughout this. But it seems like the, uh, the, the some of these dealers out here 
or, or, uh, uh, finding out information that the auction houses either don't get, can't get, or are getting and not believing. I don't, I don't know where you get this kind of a spread. But when you go back through all of these items, and you have the, this particular piece, for example, went for 130 times its high estimate. Um, uh, this bowl uh, went for uh, about 130 times its high, you know, 100 times its high estimate more, um, 150 times its high estimate. Uh, it's, it's, th there's something going on here as far as the data and cataloging, and um, th they need to, the, the, this all has to be addressed somehow. And I'm not knocking Sotheby's for it. This is a problem, um, and it's driven by uh, uh, the fake market. If these pieces had turned up in the 1970s, nobody would have said they were public pieces. Everybody would have said they're marking period. And that's, that's just the reality of it. Uh, but today, they're all afraid of, of making a mistake. And uh, regrettably, that's what you end up with. So we'll see what happens going down the road. And now, over here to the Junkunk collection. Um, this was uh, uh, some more stuff from the, from the collection of the late Stephen Junkunk. He died 40, 50 years ago. But the, the major auction houses, as we've discussed, many of you are familiar with it. They've been selling off his collection now for, I don't know, 25 years, 30 years. It never seems to end. And uh, this was an online uh, sale with some uh, sort of what I would, for Junkunk, moderately priced things um, and uh, we went through it last time because there's some awfully sweet pieces in here and I thought they represented you know the possibility maybe you might get the glom onto them and, and, and get yourself a really nice uh, object with good provenance and a lot of the things sold sort of within their estimates um, you know uh, uh, things estimated a thousand to fifteen hundred sold for two thousand uh, two to three thousand sold for thirty seven hundred uh, and you had a few things that, of course, that you know went over, and you had a couple of things I think that didn't sell at all, but not much. It's I think this this auction looked to be about 95% sold. Um, I don't think they had unreasonable reserves on any of it, and uh, overall things did well. And we're going to go through a few of them and cover some of the pieces we we talked about a month ago um, when we first covered the uh, preview for this because I thought I thought there were some awfully nice things in here, really really pretty. Sotheby's did a good job getting them, and one of them was this uh, Dewa. Bombay form incense burner estimated at two to three thousand dollars, and I thought, boy, if you could buy that in that price range, uh, you got a heck of a nice thing on your hand. It's a 17th century example, beautifully done. Had a Schwendi mark on the bottom, just the way they did the, uh, the 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 bronzes at that period. And this time around, it was stamped into the bottom of this thing. But this piece looked to be in really fine condition, with a very, very fine glaze, uh, no cracks, no hairlines, no anything, just a beautiful example. And uh, a lot of people liked it, and it ended up selling for $4,410, which I don't think was unreasonable, just a little bit, $1,000 or so above its, you know, 1400 bucks above its high estimate, but a very, very fine thing. I thought maybe this might bring five or 6000 uh, because it was so well done. Uh, uh, but block de chine isn't particularly popular in China. It's popular, but it's not as popular as enamel pieces and other monochromes. All right. And then over here to this, the Mei Ping, the turquoise crackle glaze Mei Ping, Qing Dynasty. And I, th I thought the estimate on this was awfully reasonable, two to three thousand. This is a wonderful example with this blue splash going down the front of it and that very, very fine, almost uh, like e uh, salmon egg, uh, salmon egg row. I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, crackle to it all the way down to the foot nicely done beautiful color and beautifully potted and i thought it was just a lovely thing and i thought boy if you could buy that for two to three thousand you got something and uh, apparently a lot of people liked it uh and again and it's it isn't i'm particularly good at spotting things that people will like i just I just personally thought it was really, really nice, and lots of people apparently thought it was very nice. And it ended up selling for six times its high estimate. Ended up selling for $18,900. But it's still a heck of a nice piece of porcelain. Um, and somebody paid a strong price for it, but it was, it was lovely and unusual. And then here to the Kangxi vases. Uh, we talked about these, the Femi Ver Kangxi vases. We thought, well, you know, if you can get them for that price range, you get a steal on your hands. That would be an absolutely great buy. And uh, again, they sold for uh, 300 times, 300% uh, of their, uh, more than 300% of their high estimate. They ended up selling for $5,000 for the pair, which was a very strong price. Uh, but they were very nice. Uh, and they were a pair, and pairs of Kangxi vases are, are, are not common. They're not, they are not quite an exact match pair. You'll notice the one on the left is a bit larger, uh, taller than the one on the right. 
and the and the and the, and the neck appears to be uh, wider, uh, narrower, and taller than than the one on the right. But that's really the only difference. The rest of the piece is uh, ostensibly this, uh, the same pattern all the way down, except that the one on the right has this uh, rain pattern across the foot, and the one on the left doesn't. All right, but it just shows you that uh, uh, you can get a couple of very, you know, you, you had a shot at least of getting a couple of really nice Kung Shi vases um, for a, a very reasonable estimate. It was obvious they wanted to sell them, and they ended up going for $5,000. But they're very, very pretty. And then there were these, the monochrome glazed bottle vases. I thought these were great. I thought the estimate was perfectly reasonable. And uh, they ended up selling for $3,700. Uh, I particularly like the, uh, the, the the sort of Qing Bai glazed piece on the right um, that was had the foliate rim mouth and then this lotus uh, molded area around the base and the stepped ring going down to the bottom. Very, very pretty example. I like the one on the left too a lot, the garlic neck one. It's sort of elegant and very, very simple. Uh, but, uh, you know, 18, these are both, uh, I think, I don't forget whether they dated these. They just said Qing Dynasty, I think. I sus they look to me to be 18th century, I think, but uh, uh, $3,780. But really, really nice. And, and, and there you are, you know, something from with, a, and also with very good provenance. All right. And then the yellow vase. Uh, I had a couple of inquiries about this. I don't know if one of them ended up buying it. Um, I kept looking at this thing uh, early on. I looked at it and I thought, boy, this is just such a wonderful egg yolk yellow uh, colored vase, um, even with the hairline and the, and the neck and this beautifully relief work dragon uh, or chimera coming out of it. Just very unusual, very beautifully colored, absolutely lovely. And uh, I had somebody asked me about it and I, I said, I, you know, I said, I know it sounds crazy, but I bet it brings more than 15,000. And um, 15 to 20,000, and then lo and behold, it brought 25,200. Uh, uh, but you know, I did some looking. I couldn't find another one quite like it. And um, uh, it had been bought by Stephen Junkunk, um, who died in 1978 with no history where he got it. It was seven and a quarter inches, or yeah, seven and a quarter inches tall. All right, but an absolutely beautiful thing. And again, you know, you pe people are buying with their heart, and. Um, when you're buying with your heart, you disregard the estimates. <laughs> I think that's also part of it. And then the other thing that sold that was a, sort of a big shock, and, and they're usually not that far off on jades, but every once in a while, um, you may remember, many of you remember the, um, the pig jade that came from that uh, famous, uh, the guy that started Cisco, uh, that donated all the, well, I can't think of his name, it's awful. But anyway, he donated a lot of things a couple of years ago to the Metropolitan Museum, and he had a pig jade that was estimated at four or $5,000, ended up selling for two million. Uh, it can happen. And here you have a case of a uh, really nice Ming Dynasty or later. They weren't sure. Um, I, I think the price indicates that it clearly was Ming or older. Uh, Bixi. Uh, but beautifully colored. Nice russet coloration in, in it. Uh, nice, nice, nice carving. Beautifully polished. Beautifully proportioned. Uh, all the way through, had a really modest estimate, very, very modest estimate for what it was. I think their biggest problem was trying to date it accurately. And uh, again, this is the, one of those issues. And it was estimated at eight to 12,000. And, you know, these types of jades have sold before. They've had, you know, Sotheby's has, a, has access to a phenomenal number of small jades from the Ming Dynasty and Song and uh, early Qing that have sold over the years. And, uh, the, you know, they estimated at eight to 12,000 based on probably on what they've seen in the past. And it ended up selling for $746,000. Um, so the next time somebody says to you, well, I want a high estimate at an auction item because it'll bring in a higher price, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you could have estimated this at six to $800, it would have brought the same price. Uh, it doesn't make any difference, okay. And uh, what else was there? This, oh, this thing was great. I mentioned this in the other video. I just thought it was a wonderful little carving. Uh, gilt lacquer bust of Luo Han, Ming Dynasty, um, just a great little thing. This wasn't a big carving, but the facial expression, the detail, the quality, the whole thing was just lovely. I really, really liked this a lot, and, and, it, and, and you don't have to like something because it's expensive. You can like things just because they have a modest estimate, but they just strike you. This thing struck me. I thought it was wonderful. I almost bought it. Um, uh, just absolutely great. Um, Ended up selling with a two to three thousand dollar estimate. It sold for forty seven hundred, and I think it was a wonderful buy. 
I think that was an absolutely great buy. If it sold for 30000 I wouldn't have been at all surprised. Just beautifully done. It wasn't terribly big. It was like yeah, five inches for the bust itself. So it wasn't a big, this wasn't a big, you know, life-size, uh, you know, three-quarter or, or, you know, a quarter-length bust of a figure. This was just, a, you know, five inches tall. But what a great little gem of an object. Truly, really was. Um, uh, and and, it's, and you, they did Sung heads often this way too, lacquered Sung dynasty heads. And then getting over to important Chinese works of art, his sale didn't disappoint anybody either. They had a few things that didn't do particularly well, but overall it was a blockbuster. It did great. And they started off with lot number one, uh, a pair of late Shang Ding vase at bronzes, uh, estimated at two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars, which is a pretty good estimate. And ended up selling for 1.8 million, 1 million eight hundred and ninety-five thousand five hundred dollars. Now these were beautifully patinated. They were, they were, they were, they were about as close as you're ever going to get to a match pair. And they were beautifully, beautifully patinated. One was slightly taller than the other by maybe a half an inch, and that's really about the only difference I could see between them. And the patinas are different, obviously, slightly different but uh, uh, obviously of the same age and, and so forth, but wonderful quality, beautiful, beautiful quality. And the bronze market is in general quite strong, um, uh, as we saw throughout the, uh, all the sales uh, between Christie Southers and Bottoms. All the good bronzes did very, very well or exceeded expectations in general for the for the best pieces and this was this these were uh, spectacularly well done and um, uh, <laughs> they took off and then the other thing that was a big shock was this this was a, a, a white glazed stem cup uh, sway to Tang Dynasty uh, but elegantly turned this was this is really fine um, it almost looks European in its turning, uh, but this beautifully, beautifully potted base, this, this central ball section supporting the upper upper part, this very lovely even uh, white glaze with crackle in it, and then a slight flare at the top at the mouth of the cup. Just a beautiful little cup, and um, uh, a rare, 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 rare. Uh, three and a quarter inches tall, estimated at six to eight thousand dollars U.S. Sold for eight hundred and forty-two thousand uh, dollars. The provenance. It was acquired prior to 1979. It sold at Christie's in 2009. I don't know what it brought at Christie's back then. Uh, they evidently uh, didn't think it would bring a heck of a lot, and uh, uh, for whatever reason, this this uh, it's a beautiful cup. That's the, I think the thing is that the elegant, the proportion and uh, sh uh, glaze and, and overall quality of the thing just screams as it's the best. And I, I think uh, a, a number of early pottery collectors went crazy for it. And um, now, now, now you have a new price, 842000 which will which is interesting because it'll be fun to watch to see what, uh, this, the, when prices like this happen, it usually flushes out other uh, rare Tang pieces. And people that have long-term Tang Dynasty collections with good provenance and old thermoluminescence tests, you know, prior to the 1990s, um, are looking at this saying, Meh, maybe it's time to sell. Because for a long time, Tang pottery wasn't doing particularly well because of a lot of shenanigans to do with reproductions. Well, th I think the gloves have come off here, and uh, here you are with a, with a spectacular price. Really spectacular. And then over here to this, the uh, Rue type Meiping vase with the Chin Lung mark on the bottom. Uh, this was a beautiful little vase. And uh, as many of you know, the, the Chin Lung Emperor was a, a real big fan of uh, Sung Dynasty glazes. And they, re, uh, they, they, they brought back a lot of those glazes um, during his lifetime uh, because he enjoyed them so much and they would reproduce them. And this is Rue Ware. And Rue Ware, even in the mid 18th century, in 18, 18, uh, early Chin Lung period, um, were were ex extremely sought after. They were very considered very very precious. Uh, there were very few examples, uh, just as there are today, um, and and there were only a few, you know a handful of them in the in the imperial collection. But uh, Chin Lung wrote about them, wrote about their glowing quality, and of course the Sung Dynasty being um, uh, looked back upon so fondly as a period of you know, artistic enlightenment and, and uh, quintessential Chinese thinking. Uh, they, they began reproducing them for him um, with the rain mark on the bottom like this. 
estimated at fifty to seventy thousand dollars, ended up selling for eight hundred and six thousand. Just blew it away. And uh, here's the bottom of it. And here's the foot rim. Uh, and, and you see you see lots of indications of nice natural wear around the foot. Uh, the mark is of course nicely done, but you know marks can be copied and so forth. But uh, uh, one little pit. And uh, that's all they really had on it. And the provenance was uh, the collection of Earl Runge until 1916. This is well helped well, bring the money. Sold at the American Art Association in New York in 1914, which was an auction house. That was the name of it. It was sort of the Sotheby's of the day based in the U.S. And American Art Association did a lot of auctions with um, uh, Yamanaka. And Yamanaka and, and American art would um, uh, join together um, and, and so forth. And then collection of Simon F. Rothschild and the collection of Walter Rothschild um, um, up until 1960 and then by descents. And uh, the power of provenance, there you go, took off. And uh, then, of course, the uh, great uh, garnitures or, or great uh, altar set. Um, absolutely beautiful. It didn't bring quite as much as I thought it would. I mean, it, br it, br it brought, you know, over the estimate, it brought 30% above the high estimate and all that. An absolutely uh, great looking set. Uh, Mark and period, Chin Lung, gilded, uh, very, very, very rare. A fair bit has been written about these um, uh, and the difficulty in making these. Absolutely superb. And uh, estimated, uh, as I said at the beginning, of, it was estimated at six to $800,000. I thought it might bring a million two, million three, million four. Ended up selling for $988,000. All right. So there you go. Still a very good price. You can't complain about it. But uh, uh, when, you, when you consider the, the, some of the, those Qing pieces we saw earlier, that one of them, a little, little piece sold for 500000 or this or the, or the Tang Sui Cup um, that brought almost as much as this entire garniture, um, it shows you how precise the collectors are getting out there and how they're focusing and willing to spend huge amounts on things that they are interested in and it's no longer um, you know being compared to other things from other periods when they did their buy do their buying um, and uh, this to me indicates there's there's a little bit of a softening in some of some materials and uh, a lot more interest in others all right and and this thing has uh, also had impeccable impeccable provenance a collection of Denman Ross and then Arthur John McLean the uh, curator uh, both of the both Dunman Ross and he were scholars in Asian art, and it had been in their ownership for a long time, um, and uh, it didn't make any difference really. Uh, it it might have helped it, but uh, then you had all those pieces with no provenance, but just prior to 2000, shot to the moon. So go figure. And then over here to this, this beautiful pair of Chinlung Mark bronzes. These were just lovely. I liked them a lot, and they did real well. They brought 327,000, uh, going through the high estimate of 300,000. But beautiful quality. They just they just screamed quality all over the place. Uh, nice patina. Um, good good ownership history, as I recall. They were acquired by somebody back in the 1950s, and so forth. So there you go. And then the, uh, um, uh, let's see, oh, the last thing was the Himalayan in Indian works of art. I'm not going to go through all that. Uh, it's, it's sufficient to say it also did very, very well. Everything pretty, 90% uh, of the sale appeared to have sold. Uh, Tonkas did well. Bronzes continue to be very, very strong, selling um, in the, typically in the uh, mid-upper ranges of their estimates or well beyond their upper estimates. So they, they seem to have a good handle on estimating those. I think right now the, the, trick, the, the tricky part of estimating for the uh, auction houses is going to continue to be things like uh, jades and porcelain, things that are notoriously tough to date because of their, the nature of their material. So at any rate, here we are. It'll be interesting to see what happens down the road. It'll be very interesting to see what happens down the road and how they're going to treat pieces that come in that may be spectacularly rare and um, um, uh, but have limited provenance because they were conveyed uh, back, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in a way that uh, didn't leave any trail. Didn't leave any trail. And uh, that'll, that'll, that's going to, it's probably going to force them to do a lot more research on lots going ahead um, in order to be more accurate, I think is what it's end up being. But at any rate, it was an interesting thing, and we're going to get on to the Christie's uh, uh, video when I, when I get some time here this week or, or the beginning of next week, and we'll get through them. Um, uh, but that's it.
All right. I'll be back Friday with our tomorrow with our regular video, our weekly video. And uh, thanks for watching and enjoy the autumn weather. Uh, uh, it's, it's quite lovely here in New England today. It's uh, crisp and cool. It was 48 degrees when I got up this morning. It was really lovely. Anyway, here we are. So have a, have a great day, and uh, we'll talk to you all again soon. Bye-bye.